Hello everybody, um, my name is The Prankster, and uh, this is another game with blades and blasters. Today we're going to be utilizing the Pathfinder 2E system, and we're going to be playing a homebrew game. Tonight I have with me four players, and I'm going to allow each one to just say hi really quick. Sim. What's up? Bees. I'm muted, but hello. <laughs> Wanderer. Hi. And Zypher. Hello. As I said, we're going to be getting into a game of Pathfinder 2E, and um, we're going to jump right into it here. A black screen, and all you can hear is the sound of rain. At the bottom of the screen appears the words two years ago with the words Cantargo, Chaliax. An image appears before your eyes of a city encased in cloud and shadow. Um, rain accompanying the dark clouds that overshadow the city. Occasionally lightning fills the sky with the sound of thunder not far behind. Those brief flashes of light show tall gleaming spires of the city, the spires that Cantargo are known for. As the lightning dissipates, the spires and towers disappear once again underneath the storm that is assailing this city on the coast. The waves batter the land, docks, and walls. Your vision shifts to ominously empty streets with two dwarfs encased in stocks before them. They're drenched in a rain that is pouring down and dripping off their beards and hair. You can see they are reaching out fingers towards one another, trying to find some amount of comfort in this embarrassing and dire situation. Your vision shifts again to an even more grisly scene. An outside area in front of an ominous temple. Iron spikes that stand atop a foundation of stone with a crowd gathered up round it as the rain continues to fall. They're quiet at the scene unfolding. So it is the fate that awaits anyone who dares cross house throne. Lower them, says a man with a tall buckled hat and black and red robes. He gives a flick of his hand and out comes several people with silver raven emblems on long white tunics. Some are crying and others have a steely resolve. Their fate is the same. A bitter wind kicks up into the storm, sending a chill through everyone's spine. The lightning strikes and shows a silhouette of three large devils standing atop a temple in the background. A long tapestry shows that this is the temple of Asmodeus. A black tapestry with red borders and a blood red pentagram in the middle. The devils swoop down on feathery black wings with white eyes shining in the darkness. Oops. There we go. Long carved horns are like a crown atop their head, and rain droplets hit their blood red plate mail. As they fly down, they pick up prisoners, one in each hand, fly them high. You can hear the crowd gasping, Ah! No! And they drop them from a great distance, impaling them upon the iron spikes below. Their blood runs down the spikes, and they're intermingling with the water and f flowing down the stone steps. Men and women and children avert their gaze. The man with the buckled hat speaks again. Don't you dare avert your gaze. This is the price of disobedience to the crown. The sound of his footsteps can be heard atop the stone as he strides forward towards a 16-ish year old boy in the crowd grabbing his jaw, forcing him to look upon the scene. Brandon, 
Could you tell us who this boy is, what he looks like, what's going through his head? His name is Milo. He's uh, not tall. He's not particularly interesting. Um, uh, he uh, he wears um, uh, very very plain uh, monochromatic kind of uh, natural neutral colors to uh, fit in because he knows um, how dangerous it can be um, to stand out. And um, so he has dark, dark, uh, short hair, but, and his name is Milo. And he's only, he's a high school kid, essentially. Uh, so this guard, uh, you say he, he grabs his, what just happened here? So this man with the buckled hat, who essentially was the one to begin the executions for this people strode forward as you averted your gaze and like grabbed your jaw and is like forcing you to look upon it does milo do anything um uh milo uh he he is not hard to control um uh he does again he, he doesn't want to cause trouble um so uh he he will shudder in fear, but he will uh, not run or fight. So as this happens, the screen shifts again to an empty street with water. Uh, just like water just going down the sides of the roads, slick. The quiet, however, is broken by the sounds of people in brown cloaks running down the road. A silver raven brooch, brooch is pinned to their cloak. In seconds, hounds of fire are running after them, almost nipping at their heels, with men in plate armor running not too far behind them. The black and red tabard of House Thrun is atop the exterior walls of the buildings in this ceiling, in this city. It's almost like out of a dystopian film where you know this empire is in charge. The people in cloaks take a hard right turn down an alley, doing their best to evade the pursuers that are behind them. The dogs of fire almost on their tails, roof, 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 as they too turn down into the dark alley. The men in Blake black plates smile wickedly as they approach the alley, the building still concealing it from view, only to hear the squealing of these infernal beasts as if something has gone wrong. They cautiously round the corner to see the cloaked figures and a small army of people behind a man standing in front of them all. His door, his do sword, is being pulled out of the dog's head. Zypher, could you tell us who this person is, what he looks like, and what's going through his head? You're muted. In front of, uh, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. You would see a tall, quite tall, almost uh, six foot six in height, broad-shouldered, um, extremely well-built man um, with a close-crop hair, um, which is turning white, um, a aquiline nose, and a well dis um, uh, very distinct jawline, um, a well-kept beard along that jawline. And he's standing there with his steel shield raised and uh, in his left hand, you know, a long sword in his right. Um, there is a, like a, a the, the face is set in stone almost, a hard look, um, you know, with a, you know, thousand yard stare. You see Rigzin Tingley, a paladin. The Origins of the Paladin is a little shadowy because what led to this night is also shadowy as well. There is almost a strong will about him. He knows what he has to do, but there is also a air of questioning. You can see that he he is not comfortable where he is right now, but he knows what his duty is. 
he flicks his sword, ensuring that the blood of the hound, uh, fire hound, just you know, uh, kind of spills away into the night. You know, let the rain wash that blood, that infernal blood off his blade. You know, he wants to keep it clean, away from uh, unclean beings like the hounds. He looks back to the people who just ran past him. Do not fret. Rigston is here. No harm will come to you tonight. With and that... he prepares and he moves again for the next hound dog that's in front of him. Rixon quickly dispatches of this hound dog and, uh, on fire and the small army behind him pushes out uh, before these men in black plate mail can run away, quickly overcoming them, smashing them to the ground. And after that, you hear in the distance, or just, just actually from this group of people, um... Somebody blows this horn, just... Da, 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 da. The sound echoes throughout the entire city as other horns respond in kind, albeit faintly because they're farther away. Ba, 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 ba. And it's almost like you can like zoom out for a moment and you can just see everything slow down as fire like torches begin to like dot out into the dark city, almost like stars into the night. Commotion begins happening all over the streets. The moment that these men are just dispatched, you can hear fighting and screaming and yelling as people begin to fight. People start pouring out of their homes, alleys, and corners as a full-blown battle begins to almost take place in the blink of an eye through what appears to be the whole city. A strong contingent of people burst forth from several buildings across the street from the temple. They rush forward towards the site of the executions with men, women, and children running from the grisly scene as best as they can. The devils in the air swoop down, engaging them in battle. One green-skinned fighter breaks through the ranks, rushing towards the stone foundation with the spikes coming out of it, engaging the man with the buckled hat. Sim, can you tell us who this person is, what he looks like, and what's going through his head? Uh, mad in a, uh, or I say modern, a slightly large orc looking character. Looks as evil as the devils do. Raised off in the faraway lands and honed and fighting in the fighting pits. As he breaks through the look at the guy in the buckle he just lets out a roar as he rushes and gets into his rage throwing people aside that step in front of his way fighting ensues between you and this man before you deal a mortal blow embedding your axe into his chest breathing as heavily as you possibly can and then wrenching it with a spray of blood that comes back from it the man in the buckled hat lies there, his blood now intermingling with those of his victims. The devils trying to fly away limply as they are totally overwhelmed by what is this full-on riot that's taking place. The fire that was dotting out the darkness in the city has now all kind of culminated and brings forward all towards this uh, temple. People setting the, the tabards of House Thrun, a blaze, of, of Cheliax, uh, any symbol of Abadar that they can find. As fire alights the city and the temple, and fighting takes place. From one of the temples, from one of the buildings adjacent from the street, flies a man engaging the devils as they try to run. A bolt of lightning escaping his fingertip as the devils fall to the ground with a thud. Arcane power pulsates through this man with eyes glowing blue and crackles of blue energy coursing through his arms. He seemingly multiplies and blurs himself in mid-air as he rockets off towards the temple doors. But in that moment, the temple doors open, and all that can be heard 
is the sound of rain and chanting as the battle stops for just a moment and cultists and black robes begin chanting loudly emerging from the temple. And the biggest devil you have ever seen slowly meanders through the doors with a wicked grin. At least 20 feet tall, fire trails his very goat-footed steps with a cruel look in his eye. Curved horns sit atop his head. It's amazing how torture can be so unreliable. He drops the bodies of what is a half dozen men with the silver raven symbol at his feet, broken and bloodied. The wizard looks upon the devil before briefly looking down to the ground for a familiar face, seeing everything at the same time as everybody else is doing, doing everything he can to find some elf while keeping an eye on the devil at the doors. And he spots him, a lone elf in the midst of the chaos. Wanderer, can you tell me, can you tell us who this elf is, what he looks like, and what's going through his head? Yeah. So Sabriel is uh, he is a very perplexed, uh, overwhelmed figure. Um, he just seems overwhelmed by everything that's going on. Um, uh, uh, he's an elf with, uh, he's an older elf um, with white hair slender build, average height, wearing uh, studded leather armor um, underneath a hooded cloak. Um, and he is in the temple, but kind of in the shadows, kind of hidden from sight. Chances are he would have been seen by now if it weren't for all the chaos going on. Um, and as he looks out of the temple door, he briefly Locke's gaze, his eyes meet the uh, uh, the eyes of this wizard, and he registers fear, fear for himself, but also fear for his master that stands there facing this creature of unimaginable power. The wizard and the devil engage in a battle, trading magical blows, one launching a bolt of lightning and the other a ball of hellfire that flies through the sky, illuminating the darkness in the middle of the night. It does not stop the assault on this temple, though, as men and women scream and do their best to rush through. Fighting commences again as people with silver ravens emblazoned upon their chests collide with the black-robed cultists in the vestibule of this unholy and profaned temple. A contingent of the group breaks through into the sanctuary of this place. When a call is heard, Find the Infernal Contract Repository! The large devil, on the other hand, sweeps others away from entering into the temple, blocking all entrance by killing those who would dare oppose him and his goal of keeping this place from this rebellion. The wizard sees an opportunity with the devil focused on the people, flies by... Sabriel dropping a small trinket at his feet and collides with the devil in a mass explosion. Part of the temple roof collapses on top of the temple, as well knocking him under a pile of rubble. Sabriel, perhaps you're like looking to see what has happened and you see this wizard nowhere to be found. Um... Sabriel is just frozen in shock for a moment. Um, he uh, he stands staring for a long second before having to fight off uh, an imp that's trying to attack him. And then, still seeing no sign of his master, he looks down to see what the trinket is. It's what appears to be a ring, a signet ring. You know it was the same ring that your master essentially used as his focus for all of his spells. Sabriel picks it up almost in a daze. 
um, it looks like he's not really thinking about what he's doing and he kind of puts it on his finger and looks around one last time but then he has no time to think because the tide of battle is on him again and he's fighting for his life uh, all too soon he runs out of magic and has to do the best he can with the sword he carries he has a little little skill with it but not much not enough and all around him people are dying as the temple collapses into this mass of rubble you see uh you see uh rigzin you are one of the first ones to like crest over into the temple uh perhaps you're like even standing on top of the body of this giant devil what are you doing um Rigzin would be charging um, right into the temple, you know, as he is charging. Whoever is whoever is unarmed, whoever is leading this charge, he ensures that that person comes to no harm. Rigzin is almost a whirlwind of a long sword and a shield being moved in arcs, um, followed by arcs of uh, um, uh, attacks, you know. Um, anything that comes close to... Um, the, the figures who are hooded and running into the temple, you know, any any blade, any arrow, uh, any mace, any axe, Rigzin is there with his shield and his longsword to parry it, to block it, to push it back. Um, you know, he loses count on how many people he has wounded or injured in the process, but there is a fire burning deep within him. Wrongs that he has done that he sees tonight as a way to atone for um, and just as he is about to step into the temple, you know, there's that huge explosion and the roof starts collapsing. Um, Rigzin zigzags, you know, trying to um, um, miss the debris as it falls all around him. A couple of the hooded figures get crushed, but he keeps keeps pushing forward. As, as he gets closer to the devil, um, he sees that, you know, the body is inert, charred and burning. He almost spits but then he remembers and he just shakes his head moves forward deeper into the temple deeper towards the the goal that's been set for tonight nothing's going to stop Riggs and it's either him that survives or nothing else survives kind of shift back to where that execution site is and we see a blood covered Madden uh, you see the explosion off in the distance. You hear people yelling, get to the repository. What's he doing now? After taking a deep breath from slaying his foe, he looks around, sees it's temple fallen. Here's the people yelling, get to the repository. Ah, that's the next spot. And he starts running. Again, he's running through people as they get in his way racing to get there sure milo i picture you just frozen in the midst of all of this what's going through your mind uh M milo is um i i imagine him um again he's looking at these um bodies on spikes um knowing um just the oppression that's going on for the entirety of his short life, um, uh, these guys have run the show, and he's feeling helpless. Um, he is quietly um, saying prayers um, um, in the in the uh, with the smallest hope that if if um, if his if his homeland could be freed, um, uh, he would. He would give his life um, in uh, in dedication to Serenre in, in opposition to these demons and these devils of uh, As Asmodeus. That that he would he would dedicate his life to the light. But but for now, he's only a boy, uh, so he feels um, his chin quivering, his uh, his eyes uh, welling up with tears, uh, feeling like he's powerless in his current state. But if if only there was some way to um, be free, then he would. He, he could join the fight um, if he felt like it were possible. But right now he's feeling pretty hopeless. 
with the devil collapsed underneath a pile of rubble. There is a uh, emboldened victory cry from the crowd. Yes! As the crowd seems to all in unison get just a boost of of something that comes from somewhere call it rage call it inspiration as you can see like this mass of people just like one last push forward as it like breaks through and floods into the temple running over the uh, uh the rubble doing everything that they can uh, that they can you're now in the sanctuary again you see people just like running through tearing down banners and tabards uh, knocking over uh, what appears to be relics for Asmodeus, going up to the front where perhaps there's like a, a book of Asmodeus. This we'll call it the Seven Deadly Sins. Somebody's just like ripping pages out of it. You can tell that there's just a fervor in the air from people who are tired of being oppressed for this long, and they're doing everything they can with this particular moment. And in that moment, when the temple is overrun. You can hear it. One voice at first. I found it. We, we found it. We found it. We found it. As a man rushes forward into the midst of the sanctuary, holding a contract, crackling with fire and brimstone to the exaltation of all who are there. A cry erupts in the air. It's almost like the... the 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 you know you could see that the these cultists and anybody who was in this temple serving it at that point their will whatever it was is broken as they begin to like rats do whatever they can to to flood to to get out of the temple as quickly as they possibly can it appears in that moment that the battle has ended that the long night has been finished People are rejoicing in the midst of a city that is on fire. The screen goes black. We see the same city, but a much different scene. A new dawn. The golden light of the sun just barely coming up and over it with a little phrase at the bottom that says, two years later, present day. You see people milling about on the streets with a sense of joy, a sense of just being able to live out the day without having to worry about oppression. The tabards and the banners that were on the exterior of the walls that you once saw are no longer there. There's no sign of Asmodeus. There's no sign of House Throne. There's no sign of what appears to be any agent of Cheliax. I want to take a moment to revisit our characters in this brand new day two years later let's start with Madden what is your character doing now that there's some freedom in the town uh, Madden spends his time still honing his skills with the sword Knowing that freedom is never, never solid. Freedom has always been fought by the evil to be taken away. Knowing that they may just be a few stones throw away from an invasion of some sort. Sure. But. Oh, go ahead. You're gonna you're gonna say something else. Negative. And so you see the scene of Madden uh, fighting, training, maybe even training people to fight. Um, maybe in kind of like a, a, a part of the city they, where uh, it's almost like a, a, a gym of sorts. 
Rigson, where are you and what are you doing? Rigson is away from the city, out in the suburbs, where things are a lot more quieter, less people. He's been here ever since that fiery night, um, ever since that whatever happened at the Temple of Asmodeus. After that event, he recluse himself to the outskirts, close by, but never close enough, uh, where the other people see him or notice him. It's almost like a commune. Uh, think of it as a, um, a small uh, homestead, um, like a ranch, you know, what, what, would be, what would look like a ranch in, in a world like this. Um, there are farmhands around, you know, some people are uh, tilling the land. There are people who are working a water wheel to pump water down, you know, the various canals that have been dug. Um, Rigzin himself is, um, you know, chopping, chopping wood, uh, you know, uh, you know, and he's basically making spikes. There's a bunch of spikes already on his right hand side, um, clearly he's working towards building a fence uh, of some sort. Um, he's not in, you know, any sort of armor or uh, uh, battle clothing. He's just wearing simple, just wearing a simple tunic, um, you know, pantaloons and, you know, um, what looks like a standard pair of shoes. Um, there is a, like a, you know, bead of sweat on his brow as he stops, you know, a, a small uh, gust of breeze comes his way as he kind of stands up and stretches and enjoys it. You know, um, looks down at his hands, you know, uh, usually seen them wearing gauntlets, um, hide gloves, uh, but right now they're just there, you know, with mud and grit underneath the nails, um, calluses all over. He bends down, picks up a, a jug of water, uh, takes a long uh, swig, puts it down, ah, a deep breath, you know, enjoying his time in nature. And, and then he kind of goes back, you know, picks up a log of uh, wood from his left and starts uh, um, chopping it, um, you know, the top of it, removing edges and sharpening it into um, into a spike. And drops it to his right and picks one more and just continues to do that, um, enjoying the, the manual labor, the the chance, the blessing to do manual labor and away from the bloodshed. In this moment where you are engaged in this activity of creating a fence, of chopping wood, of forming everything, you have, uh, you could kind of see in the distance a man in a cloak, uh, with kind of a brooch, which is a silver raven. You see him coming up to the road towards your property. Rigzin looks up, stares at the man coming towards him for a while, shakes his head a little slightly and then goes back to what he is doing, hoping within his heart that the man is not here for him and is just going to pass by his house. As the man continues to walk towards you, unfortunately, he does exactly what you did not want him to do. and makes his, opens, uh, stands at the gate, sees you chopping and kind of waves his hand towards you as indicating that he'd like a moment to talk. Rigzin sighs, sighs deeply. He finishes the the spike that he's currently working on, drops it to the right, embeds the axe into you know, the into the wooden table, and makes his way to the gate. Hello there, fine morning for a walk. I see. Fine morning indeed. 
Uh, are you Riggs and Tinley? I am. And you are? Ah, uh, I'm uh, Nanar Oma. Uh, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. And as he... Uh, pleasure is mine. Come on in. And Riggs in opens the, you know, the gate to his property. Come on in. I wouldn't want someone like you standing on the road having a discussion with me. Come on in. Thank Come you. sit by this tree and you know, Riggs and kind of takes him to a tree that's on the property. There are a couple of stools, um, a small little table and there's a, a jug of water and a couple of glasses. Please have a drink. Refresh yourself. He takes your hospitality and comes on in and, and takes a seat takes the cloak off of his head and you can see that he's a dark-skinned human uh, with just brown eyes kind of some scruff and he looks and he says I tell you what this is this is pretty great out here and he kind of kind of like looks off towards I, I picture your ranch kind of like so you could still see the sea and the water Maybe like the sun kind of like bouncing off the water. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a very idyllic place, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, you don't hear anything from the city. You can see the city in the distance. But uh, what you see more is, yes, the sun, um, you know, the, the, the water, just like lush green plains beyond the, the fence line of my homestead. Um, yeah. it's, it's a small piece of heaven on, you know, in... In Kintago. Well, I'm. Don't want to take up too much of your um, time, my friend. Um, Breaks in, uh, and he kind of like reaches into this satchel and he pulls out what appears to be a uh, kind of like a, a missive with a red wax seal, and you can see kind of a raven as as part of like that stamp. Hands it to you, and he says. I'm certain you know that th this is about. We need your help again. While Contargo might be free, and then he stands up at that and kind of looks at you one last time. It still needs your help to stay that way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, GM. Uh, just a question: Does did you say this person's name? I just want, I'm taking notes. Sure. His name is uh, Nenar Oma. Thank you, sir. I didn't mean to, a to interrupt. You're good. <clears throat> uh, with that, as Nana stands up to get up, he's, uh, Nana just hands him the scroll, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he hands him a, essentially it's like a sealed envelope with a wax seal on it. Okay. And as Nana stands up, um, you know, Rigzin stands up as well. Thank you. I will take care of my business here and attend to this as quickly as I can. He nods at you and begins to walk down that idyllic pathway back towards Contargo um, with the water kind of, the, the beautiful ocean kind of there. I need to take a step back because I forgot to do something. In this gym in Contargo, we can see Sim... We, I'm sorry, we can see Madden uh, just laying it out on this heavy bag. Maybe even taking his uh, weapon and practicing on kind of like this wood uh, statue puppet that people would use for practicing their own strikes. You see as well, out of the corner of your eye while you're working, while you're, while you are working out a man with a gray cloak as well heading towards you and as he draws near you see that same silver raven emblem emblem on his cloak that's for that's for sim as he sees him coming he wipes some sweat from his brow uh, a visitor. He'll set his uh, 
his sword down as he's been using it and polishing it and keeping it cleaned. Aye. Uh, my name is Trellet. It's good to meet you. It sticks out a hand for a handshake. Ah, uh, yes, it's good to meet you, and he'll grab his hand, shake it. I won't take your time. I know that you're, um, getting your work done. And he reaches into a satchel with what appears to be an identical envelope with the same red emblem in stamped form that we saw earlier towards Madden. Uh, what is this? Well, um, there's been some rumblings, and uh, Ravenel needs you. Um, we're still getting on our feet after, well, two years ago, and uh, we're a little short-handed, so the Silver Ravens are looking for folk that can help us take care of some of the things that the government can't quite get to yet. Ah, uh, you grab the envelope. Say no more. What am I needed? Ah, I'm gonna need you at the Cuddle Club. I, I'll be there. Gives you a nod. And uh, you would know that the Cuddle, and I just want to make, I want to enunciate that Cuddle, <laughs> the Cuddle Club, is uh, essentially kind of a tavern near the edge of Kentargo. It's not actually in the city walls. It's on the, uh, if you still have the map of Cantargo up, it is over here, kind of on the exterior, this little portion over here. So he nods at you and makes his way out. Yeah, I was, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to clarify. Uh, with that said, let's check in on another one of our intrepid heroes. Sabriel, what has your character been up to since then? Uh, Sabriel has been studying and studying and studying and practicing. Uh, he's really been quite obsessed with um, trying to better himself. Um, at the time of the uprising, he really only knew a few cantrips now he's learned sort of proper bells but it's been a it's been a hard road because he's pushed himself too hard put too much pressure on himself uh you know, he's never felt that his efforts are good enough so he's pushed himself too hard you know too little sleep uh too little downtime too little to eat um not realizing that that wasn't making things any better. Um, so he's, he looks a little hollow cheeked now. Um, and uh, there is a slight haunted quality to his eyes. Uh, but he is, wherever we find him, we'll find him with a book in his hand, a book of spells. Um, probably out of the sunlight because he's got used to studying at night and uh, I'm a little sensitive to daylight. Yeah. Other students, other students will be around, you know, their lessons are over for the day. And they'll be maybe heading to a tavern. He'll wave them away and go back to his studies. Yeah, I picture you in you know, essentially the the academy here in Cantargo. Uh, probably long nights in the library with dusty tomes and that, 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 that smell of ink and newly pressed paper. Um, but a little desk, you know, with the, the light of your candle. Maybe it's like just a time lapse. Day one, the candle's all full and you're reading. Day two, it's, it's there and you're still in that same exact spot. You know, nights and days pass. Maybe even bags under your eyes from a long night studying. Um, perhaps one of the nights when you are studying in, la in late, um, you can, you would hear audibly like the sound of footsteps coming through the library. And you know that 
for all intents and purposes, you're when it's this time of the day, you're really the only one that's there. But you hear that the footsteps are drawing closer and closer to you. Um, his Sabriel's face shows uh, ex different expressions kind of f flit across it. Um, first, he looks like he's going to dismiss this. Then as the footsteps get a little closer, he looks irritated. Seems likely to be an interruption. And then a little suspicion crosses his face as well. And he draws a dagger from his belt and puts it in his hand and puts one hand under the table out of sight with the dagger in it. And then with the other hand carries on reading the book. And a close observer can now see that although he's still looking at the book, he's headed down so he's got better peripheral vision to the sides and he's keeping an eye out around him. So out of your peripheral vision, you see it. A person in a gray cloak with that brooch on uh, their left breast of the cloak coming near you, a brooch of a silver raven. It appears that they're making no uh, attempts to hide themselves and are walking towards you openly with hands out and open. Um, Sabriel's uh, uh, hand relaxes a little, and he slips the dagger back in his uh, back in his belt, and sighs, puts uh, a a placeholder in the book, you know, a bookmark in, and closes it, then turns to face the person. You turn and you see a woman who's removing the top part of her cloak, uh, just curly brunette hair uh, with uh, green eyes and freckles and very bubbly presence. Um, hi! Um, are you Sabriel? I am, yes. Oh, it's so good to meet you. Um, hey, I uh, was told that I need to, and she kind of like starts ruffling through her satchel, give you this. And it's an envelope with that same red stamp atop it like you've seen uh, for other people. And she reaching out her hand to give it to you. He takes it and says, what is this? I was expecting nothing. Well, um... Yes, I would understand that, uh, what with Contargo being free now and all. But, um, well, you know, duty calls. Uh, Silver Ravens could use some help. The government's still a bit shorthanded. So, um, if you can, uh, we'd like to talk to you about serving your country, Raveno. Yeah. Yeah, about halfway through, halfway during her um, speech, he just, uh, he stops listening to her and he's looking down at the envelope in his hands and his gaze goes a little distant. Um, and he says to himself quietly, no, too soon, too soon, I'm not ready, not strong enough. And then as she finishes talking, he becomes aware of the silence and... He looks up at her and then uh, takes a deep breath. Let's it out in a sigh. Very well. Pravenel calls, I will answer. <sighs> like a big, you could see that you know she was listening to you and kind of like a sense of despondency was coming across her face. And then as you say that, you can see that the weight just poof, falls off. And she has a big sigh of relief. <sighs> Oh, well, that's great. Um, awesome. Well, hey, I am uh, very much looking forward uh, to this, and thank you so much. This is going to be great. Um, great. Uh, well, you have the address and the instructions all in there. Uh, so if you have any questions, go ahead and, uh, well, meet us at the Cuddle Club. Very well. I will do that. Thank you for your time. Oh, I thanks. trust you may can see yourself out. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I can. Thank you. And as she turns around, she kind of like trips across a bit of a chair. 
looks back at you a little bit uh, blushed and makes her way out. And Sabriel turns and opens his book again and he looks at the page again for a few minutes and then with almost a sort of exasperated kind of almost a snarl he kind of slams the book shut and then breaks the seal on the envelope and starts re- uh, pulls out the paper and starts reading screen uh, fades out and we go to another person this time uh, Milo why don't you tell us what uh, you've been up to I imagine um, as far as the cinematography goes, we see um, young Milo uh, with his eyes filled with tears and his chin quivering in, in fear and, um, and uh, desperation uh, uh, from the previous scene. Over the past two years, um, he still keeps a fairly uh, young look to him um, he still has a uh, very tight young skin but it's just uh, slightly uh, more masculine as his jaw fills out um, and his eyes go from fear to um, to a bit of intensity as he has grown and um, and where his clothes were once fairly nondescript wanting to fit in uh, he now dons um uh these beautiful like like loud golden robes of uh of uh um Seren Ray uh that's gold with some blue. Um uh, it's very loud, very uh easy to see stands out in the crowd. And um he is now uh he's in seminary studying um uh, his holy texts learning as much as he can about uh, Seren Ray to be a, a, a cleric. Um, so I imagine we see him uh, maybe uh, copying some scrolls, uh, studying holy text, um, but uh, he's also longing for um, uh, for the chance to make a difference. Um, having seen what the, um, what the, the uh, Silver Ravens did um, uh, it was a couple of years back. Uh, that's the kind of effect he wants to have on the world, and so he is actually um, beseeching his uh, his the, his abbot or the, uh, the I don't know the uh, the dean of his seminary, the the leader of his little monastery slash school, uh, just asking for the chance to have a leave of absence to serve with um, to serve with this group that um, is really making things happen and that uh, he feels like as a, as a, uh, a new, a young cleric of uh, Saren Ray, that he can really make a difference uh, bringing light in this uh, battle against darkness. So I picture you in class, um, maybe there's a lecture going on talking about Saren Ray there's a kind of a befuddled, or not befuddled, but there's a, a, a cleric mm-hmm. who's already up there dressed in the same blue and yellow robes that you are wearing. In fact, the whole of everybody there is all dressed in these robes. Um, it's not just you. You are with others, with people who are studying the same exact things. So this man... You can kind of like see that he has like graying hair, kind of an older look and complexion in his face. And it looks like he's already been teaching to all of you for some time. Looks at you, uh, looks at everyone really, as, as he's teaching. And he says, you see, and that is why Serenre is important. It's not just that she holds mercy in one hand but it's that she holds justice in the other. A life without too focused on one 
is unacceptable. There will be times where this is tested in all of you. And he makes certain to meet like every single person's eye. And in that moment, that is where you'll meet Saren Ray herself. Well, I think that is enough for today. And so I uh, would like to um, dismiss all of you, but I just want to make certain that uh, everybody goes home and reads um, a chapter in the uh, Hellfire and Judgment section of the Holy Text, as well as uh, Compassion and Goodness. Um, I expect at least a scroll on each. Please have that uh, back on the following day. Everybody kind of like shuffles to get ready and to, uh, they kind of like start filing out and I picture you kind of like lagging behind. Maybe you had too many book books or scrolls or whatever out. And uh, the person, uh, this professor goes towards you and approaches you. Um, my good Milo, do you have a moment? Of, of course. Yes, yes, Abba. What, what can I do? We have received your desire to serve with the Silver Ravens. And um, yeah. he sits down and looks at you just like very pointedly. I want to know why. Tell me. To my face. Uh, well, Abbot, I, I, I believe, I, I, I believe that the, the, the dawn brings new light, as, as we've learned in our holy text, and that these uh, silver ravens, they, they are, they're doing the work, and, uh, uh, well, Sarah Ray should take some of the credit for, for, for the good that they're, they're doing. I, I know she's at work with them, and, and I think that I can help uh, be a, a voice for Sarah Ray, be a representative uh, for her, and, 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 and to, to, give, to give glory to her and, and to help redeem those who, who might turn away from evil. I... So you're kind of like... I think that, uh, you're kind of stammering, and he, he puts his hands up, and he's like, I... I know of your zeal, Milo, and it is, it's a good, and it is a, a good thing. And he looks down, clearly just thinking about what to, 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 to tell you. Looking you up, he meets you in the eye. Look, it is, ever since the Temple of Asmodeus was turned into multi-faith temple, we have been given a new chance here in Kentarko. Where we once worshipped in the shadows, we now are able to worship in the light. Serenry's light. Yes. The truth is, is that does need to be protected. So he um, looks at you, like trying to like almost weigh you with his eyes one last time and reaches into a coat pocket and grabs an envelope with a red stamped seal and hands it to you. Do good in her name, Milo. Remember, it is not just justice. And he kind of like stands up and puts a hand on your shoulder and gives it a good squeeze and then uh, slowly walks away. I, I imagine Milo um, uh, looking at this thing and uh, uh, the, the biggest smile on his face um, as he gives uh, the holy symbol uh, kind of sign that he gives to his hand and uh, he would run away like he's got Willy Wonka's golden ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine he, he runs away and reads the, uh, 
the uh, letter. Yeah. So you run away, you read the letter. We fast forward to the in evening in Cantargo. A, um, after the events of the day, everybody kind of going through their, their regular lives and everything else that was going on, you decide to go to this place, the Cuttle Club, that was, uh, that was, you were given directions to, um, and so, can we go to our first actual map? Go ahead and share this with you guys, and then I gotta drop you all over on the map. Boof. Boof and boof. Um, now, you should all have control over your tokens. You should see it at the bottom of the map. Do you all have the ability to left click on your token and move it? Oh, you know what? Let me go ahead and turn that permission off. You should be able to move them freely now. Yep. Awesome. All good. Great. Um, one of the things um, the Fantasy Grounds does, just FYI, is it will only move you like a half step. So what I would suggest um, is when you left click your token, go ahead and use your arrows and it will move you a full square. And it's just a little bit uh, easier that way. Cool, thanks. Great. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead, if you would all, um, so one other little tool I wanna show you, I guess I told you all I would teach you guys a couple of things when we got on our first battle map. If you hold down your left and right trigger on the battle map, you will have a, a ruler. And this is how we'll be able to uh, point to things. Like, you should all be able to see my ruler, correct? Yep. Mm. Great. Yes, you're 55. Yeah, yes. Great, great, cool. So if you would all take your tokens and move them over here, out, off onto this balcony to the top right of yourselves, or northeast. Or just follow the arrow. There you go. So you also, just so you're aware, you can just drag and drop your uh, tokens, but if you guys like moving them around like that, I know I do, it feels like an action figure for me, like on a playset like when I was a kid. You're more than welcome to. But just giving you guys uh, a, a couple heads up about those things. How, how do you do that uh, uh, that arrow? Hold, uh, so on the, on the battle map, hold down left and right click and drag. I can see you started it on yourself, but now you need to drag it. Oh, I see. I see. <laughs> hey, it's okay. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah. I'm, I'm not using my mouse right now, so that's why. Okay, that's it. Oh, yeah, I'll gotcha. do it every time. Oh, that would be a problem. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to go ahead and uh, continue to move here after that brief intermission. You're in the entrance of the uh, Cuddle Club. All of you arriving at different times. Um, you would see kind of in the back left corner of this particular restaurant uh, a man in a, a silver cloak <laughs> um, and actually with just like silver white hair standing in the left corner you see him uh, over here where my arrow is pointing towards you see that uh, he has a cloak with the silver raven's brooch from the people that you've been approached by all day. And I'll let you guys arrive in whatever order you want. We've already done a lot of our introductions. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and uh, as you make your way in uh, and see him at various different times, who do you think is the most prompt out of all of you? Uh, Milo would, would, I mean, as a uh, cleric of the sun, he used to wake up early, being uh, early. Um, and he's also extremely enthusiastic about this new um, 
gig. So um, he, he would be there early. Yeah, Sabrio will be precisely on time. Great. So I, I imagine uh, Milo uh, arriving, um, uh, looking around at all of the uh, various shady figures, um, uh, looking at every one of them, <laughs> looking at the barkeep, um, uh, seeing no one of interest. Um, <laughs> I suppose he'd make his way over to this gentleman. Sure. And say, yes, yes. Yes, I'm, I'm here for, for the Silver Ravens, yes? Yeah, the, the man looks at you and your enthusiasm, and he just, like, nods quietly and just um, as if to say, chill out, dude. We're glad you're here. Um, yes, yes, uh, no, please, please take a seat. We'll wait for the, uh, the other uh, folks to arrive, and we will uh, talk shortly. And in the meantime, he tries to make small talk with you, just, how was your day? What were you doing? That type of thing. My name is Milo. I hear a, he's happy to talk to him. Yeah, he's probably happy to get out of the the the, the cloister of clerics. Yeah, yeah, uh, out of the boring old clergy people. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> All right. Uh, how about the rest of you? Yeah, as soon as it's as the as the hour strikes, you know. And, and uh, maybe that can be heard in the distance. Um, precisely at that moment, uh, Sabriel walks in the door. He's got a hood up over his face, um, pulls it back as he enters the room, uh, showing his pale skin and paler hair. And he looks around the room and swiftly sees the, the man with the silver raven brooch. And then just for a second kind of freezes, takes a breath and then walks over to the table and um, he pulls out the envelope from inside his cloak and said I was requested to attend Ah, yes uh, the wizard Sebriel, correct? That is correct Excellent uh, Perhaps Apprentice Wizard would be a more accurate description I have much studying left to do well uh, apprentice please uh, take a seat uh, we will wait for the rest of the uh, uh, the members of this group to show up very well uh, do you mind if I read I have a tome here that I was uh, studying oh um pl please yes go go ahead and read that's fine and what, he sits down at the what table. Are you what, are, what are you reading? Ah, it's a, it's a new spell I'm trying to master. Uh, I'm not strong enough for it yet. Uh, it gives you the ability to project multiple uh, illusionary duplicates of yourself. Um, mirror image. Common spell, but uh, it eludes me still. Well, I don't think I, I've been studying hard enough. I've, I've heard of it. I I, I I admire your ambition. Ah, well, my ambition is not the problem, sadly, it's my skill. Ah, but I I will keep trying. Thank you. Uh, I should introduce myself. My name is Sabriel, and he holds out a hand across the table. Milo quickly reaches and grabs your hand. Uh, Milo, uh, I, a cleric of Saren Ray. It's, it's so good to meet you. And you. Um, well, yes. And then he sort of smiles and uh, just looks down at his book and starts reading oblivious to everything around him. <laughs> I've seen Rigzin wandering all over the bar. Yeah, so uh, uh, Rigzin would get there um, a little after uh, the, uh, the requested time. Um, you know, as he leaves his home, he went to his neighbor's place, um, spoke a little, uh, asked him to look after his homestead, you know, put all his in in instruments and implements back in their shed, cleaned everything up. Then he donned his armor, his uh, uh, boots, 
picked up his shield and sword, uh, walked out of his home, and as he did, he you know, turns around, gave it one last look, smiled a woeful but hopeful smile, hoping to return here soon. And as he, every step he takes towards uh, the city, you know, he there's a, a slight level of anxiety that kind of rises within him. He's not sure what what lays ahead. Um, he was hoping that his deed that night would all would be all that was required of him, but maybe that is not the case. Maybe there is more trials and ahead of him. And then he eventually gets to the cuttle club and seeing all these people around, um, he grows a little uneasy. He walks to the barkeep. A mug of your fine ale, please. Ah, yes, my good man. Um, that'll be a copper piece. Riggs in, reaches into his uh, uh, armor, take, takes open a bag of money and puts a copper piece on the bar counter. Ah, you see the bartender kind of go behind and there is a tap attached to a big kind of like oaken barrel, grabs a big old mug and, you know, you can see him, he tilts the cup, starts to pour the beer into the cup and as it begins to crawl up the side, he levels it off with the foam. Thank you, my good man. Puts it down. By any chance, are you wearing anything, um, anything of the Silver Ravens related on your person? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't be. I don't think I was, um, you know, in that chaotic night, I don't think there was anything given to me. Um, um, so I don't have like a, you know, one of those brooches or anything like that, that I would be able to show. Sure. Well, thank you, my good man. And he nods at you after putting the mug of ale on the counter. A pleasant evening to you too. And he picks up the mug, um, takes a, a good measured sip, and he turns around and looks across um, uh, the hall and scans each table. Eventually his eyes fall on the silver-haired man on the far side of the room. Um, he sees the two people sitting with him um, and he starts making his way towards the table. He comes to the table, eventually he stands there and introduces himself. The name is Riggs and Tinley. I was asked to be here at this appointed hour. Ah, Riggs and um, glad that you're here. And he stands up, uh, uh, shakes your hand. I thank you for this opportunity to serve again. And with that, he uh, takes a seat and looks at the two gentlemen sitting beside the silver-haired man. As Sabriel looks up a little belatedly from his book, um, and then as he sees Rigsin, he he looks absolutely astonished, maybe even almost shocked, and and then sort of stammers i i you you're you're him i i saw you that night the the night it all changed in that place you you were everything i wasn't you were strong you were they all fell before you and then he realizes he's, you know, he's kind of babbling a little bit and says, um, ah, I, I apologize. Um, I am Sabriel and I am so pleased to make your acquaintance. And he kind of pulls his chair a little closer to here and then stands up and uh, offers his hand for Rigsin to shake. Uh, Rigsin is taken aback a little, someone remembering him from that night and using you know the words of praise of strength and he looks at you closely though he can't place your face naturally he can't place anybody's face that night 
I did what I could. I wish, and you can see his voice quivers a bit. I could have done more. Could have done more. You have Maybe nothing that's to prove. Why I'm here. Sabriel hmm. looks surprised and says, "You have nothing to berate yourself for. You were." Uh... Well, I only saw you from a distance, but you are a light amid the darkness. Such strength, such power, such bravery. Wow. And you have a feeling that it was just a little bit of emphasis on the you at the start of that. Mm-hmm. And Rigzin continues to, you know, look at Sabriel and he wants to say something. You can see he feels he wants to say something, but he decides against it, decides that it's not the right place. Um, I thank you for your kind words, Elf. I uh, means a lot. Uh, Please, Milo. Sit. Um, Milo, just, just, just kind of. I, th- I, I imagine Milo also recognizes uh, Rigsen. From, from the uh, the siege at the uh, temple of Asmodeus, and um, his jaw just kind of drops. Like this is a this is a true hero. Um, of course, f- from Milo's perspective, he was only a child at the time, but but he has great shame over the fact that he froze in the face of um, this power that was that was threatening his people, and he did not stand up. He he did not fight. Did not do anything and but but he would never let anybody know that this is his 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 greatest shame is that is that he did, he did nothing at that time so but but instead of telling them that he recognizes them that he was there uh outside of the temple instead what he says is um um uh, you, uh, you you could have done more but um we we will do more this is this is his whole purpose. Is, is that uh, he he may have failed once, but but um, he will do do more from this point on. Um, this is why he's here. You can do more. You could have done more, but but you but you and and we will do more together. Uh, My, Milo, I I I am a a, a cleric. Of Saren Ray, he says, like with such pride. Although, like you can see, he's clearly wearing the vestments. He's like waving around his holy symbol in his hand. Like obviously, you don't need to tell us what you are. We see what you are, but he says it with pride anyway. And when you say those exact words with that uh, exact purpose, purposefulness, and that that belief, you know, um, you for the first time sense. Um, from this man, like till now, you know, everything was cordial, but the moment you have that uh, that belief that is just emanating from you, he looks at you and there is a a, a grim look. A, it's almost like a grimace uh, when he looks at you. And um, his jaw clenches for a bit and then, then you know, he, he closes his eyes, opens it again and He's trying to bring serenity back in himself. Milo, pleasure to meet you. If you say we can do good, then we'll do our best to do good. Hmm. And he kind of looks at you like he just stares at you for a bit. Um, And then he kind of shakes his head and uh, looks back at his glass and picks it up and takes uh, one more measured sip. Last but not least. Man would approach the door and kind of brush off his cloak a little bit and step inside and do a look around. Uh, Everybody's always up to some reverly. And he'll drop his cloak back. <sighs> what are we supposed to meet? And he'll kind of scan the room around. And he'll look over to, to a small group of people across the room. 
Uh, I recognize one of them. There's a brooch on the other. I guess that's what I'm going. You know, kind of walk towards the old guy sitting at the table to, to kind of brush past him. Excuse me, old man. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> he kind of just—he doesn't like wait for him to kind of move or nothing like that. Just kind of tilts his chair as he walks by him. <clears throat> you know, kind of continue walking. Sure. Well, I see that we have a silver raven brooch. I recognize the paladin across the way. Uh, yes, my good man. Uh, so glad that you could join us. And he uh, stands up and uh, shakes your hand. Um, I am going to go talk to the bartender about getting a room in the back. Why don't you all take a moment to get to know each other a little bit better? And uh, he excuses himself for a moment and does exactly that, making his way to the bartender to talk for a moment. Milo, you specifically remember that this is the dude that killed the guy that clenched your jaw. Yeah, that that's pretty badass. Um, I'm not sure that um, uh, he would he would say anything outright. Again, he is uh, he he would never admit to anybody that he was there and what he saw that day. Although it has been formative in his identity and his calling, um, he 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 would never say out loud, "I was there. I saw this. Um, I was cowardly while others were brave." But um, he will he will bravely uh, I'm sorry he will happily welcome uh, uh, Madden is how you say your name is that correct Sure <laughs> Yes uh, he he will happily welcome Madden and say and say uh, so so good to meet you uh, fellow uh, Silver Raven uh, My name is is Milo I I, I am also a, a a cleric of Saren Ray Ah. Uh. A cleric. He'll set his sword down and pull the chair out and sit down. And then he'll look and see. Are you offering your hand out to him or anything? Absolutely. He'll he'll stand back up. Ah, excuse me. And he'll shake the hand, like envelop his hand, and you just feel it's all rough skin. Oh, I can imagine, especially up against his very soft, young, like inexperienced hands. He is not known combat. It's a pleasure to have you with us, I'm sure. Yes, you knowingly, he says, you have you have fought w with the Ravens before, yes? Ah, yes. Aside from that rebellion that took place years ago, I also was with them before that. Uh, I, I would I would love to to hear stories of of all that you've done uh, to bring justice and, and liberation to our people. Well, I'm sure there will be time for that. Especially if these, as I take it, if we're being called together and the devils are about to come back to our city, to our, to our duchy. What? Uh, what have you heard? I yeah. just... Elf off to his right has suddenly uh, had been um, mainly looking at the paladin and seemed struggling for something to say, but now has turned his full attention onto him. Well, I can only assume that they eventually want to take this back, and that if we're being called, it has something to do with that. I could be wrong, though. Sabriel turns his attention to the. Uh, Where's, where's the other man gone? Is he over by the bar now? Yeah, he... He was ordering drink. He's yeah. over there, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, he says, uh, we'll, we'll have to ask. I, uh, I, hope I am not. I'm, I'm, I'm not ready. I'm not strong enough yet. I need to study more. Uh, uh, nobody is strong enough at first. You'll quickly see how strong you really are if, if push comes to shove. True, true. 
Last time I was found wanting. And I told myself never again. Never again. And then he sort of realizes he's kind of not introduced himself and kind of almost visibly kind of shakes himself out of it and holds his hand out and says, uh, where are my manners? I am Sabriel. Uh, I'll be mad at and he'll shake his hand. So, yeah. were you a part of the rebellion as well? I, I tried. Yes. Uh, but I had too little magic, too little skill with a sword. I wasted so many years when I could have been practicing. I could have made myself stronger had I known that day was coming. Instead, people around me died because I wasn't strong enough to save them. Never again. People die all the time, especially in battle. We succeeded, which means you succeeded. Uh, uh, I imagine the camera's like panning to Milo every time he says that he failed. He failed to act. He he was found wanting. <laughs> every time the camera goes to him, just not saying a word. <laughs> um, <laughs> So in the middle of your conversation, you can see that the silver-haired man who has told you that he is a silver raven comes walking back to your group. Ah, my, uh, my friends, I have secured us a bit of a more, and he kind of leans in, or private uh, area to speak. Uh, if you'd be so kind as to follow me, I would, uh, we can make our way into one of the back rooms. And you see him heading north uh, towards this room over here. <laughs> just watching. Like we're, we're, we're moving like South Park characters. Just kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of how it feels like. <laughs> As you make your way into the back room, you can hear kind of the reverie that was in front kind of become a little bit quiet uh, quieter the man sits down at the table and invites all of you a waitress comes in um, specifically tasked with uh, serving you and maybe takes a one of your orders and the gentleman says well it's on the silver ravens it's it's, it's on the house so please don't worry um, it's the least we can do for everything that you've done for us give him uh, you give her your orders and she then begins to uh, walk away to go fill it uh, shortly afterwards I know all of you have received a, a summons from the Silver Ravens because the truth of the matter is is that your assistance is needed as you know, Kentargo is still getting uh, up on its feet. Um, while Ravenel, on the whole, has been safe, um, it doesn't mean that it's entirely safe and that everything is perfect. The truth of the matter is, is that we try to keep some of the things out of the papers. We would hate for... We don't want... Everybody worked so hard to gain a sense of, of, of peace and freedom that they don't need to know everything that's going on. The, the government is still working hand in hand with the Silver Ravens um, to help fulfill some of its duties in the meantime. But we've recently caught wind of a cult of Asmodeus that has been forming. Um, it's nothing it's, it's 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 not a huge thing but nonetheless it needs to be investigated and it needs to be um, dispersed um, while we definitely welcome while can Contargo struggles to hold the line between being welcoming of all faiths but in particular Asmodeus and he says that with some disdain on his lips We've all felt the effects of what that rain looked like and the full fruit of that religion. Cheliax 
still sends agents here to subvert, to get people to sign infernal contracts, to sell their souls into slavery, that manner of things. Um, and so we're doing what we can to keep it at bay, to keep it from spreading. Um, in particular, there's a small town west of here, west of Cantargo. And uh, we need you to go and investigate this cult to, to, to see how, how deep it is, how widespread it is, and to, to well, to deal with it. Um, I leave that up to you. I ultimately trust in, in your discretion. Um, if they are worshipping within the bounds of law and well, not doing anything terrible, it's difficult for us to, to do anything. But we still need to ascertain exactly what is going on. That is what we need your group to do. Uh, to go and ascertain the extent of this cult, what are the teaching, and um, if it is in opposition to any of the laws that Ravenel has set forward, um, to dispatch of it. And then he kind of like leans in quietly because we cannot let that spread here. Not without an eye on it. And he leans back in his chair. Do you have any questions on this? Are there any thoughts that you might have? First thought is agreement, says Sabriel. I, we cannot go back to what we were. Too many lives were lost, too much blood spilled, too much was sacrificed. I will do whatever I can. The man uh, looks at you and, and nods. And the. I should mention, I forgot to say this earlier, my apologies. Uh, his name is uh, Sedru. He introduced himself as Sedru. So he no, uh, he nods in agreement. What say the rest of you? Vigzin looks at Sedru. If they are practicing the worship of Asmodeus within reason within some sort of restraint what do we do then he looks at you and shakes his head um as if to say like as if to like show that he agrees with your sense of unease I'm sorry, what, what, what did you say again? He he shakes his head as if to uh, to agree with his sense of unease. I know that it's like a normally a no motion, but um, but yeah, he's kind of using it in the way that like, I hope that's not the case. That's kind of the body language that he's communicating. Mm -hmm. um, if they are practicing within the restraint of law, if if somehow this, this group, this cult is operating in such a way that and he like puts his hands up as if to say, I don't know then we still need to keep tabs on them. And keep in mind and he looks at Rigzin very pointedly uh, with kind of a finger in the air. And keep in mind, we know how Asmodeus is particularly legalistic to the letter of the law while he can he and his followers can at the same time almost flout the spirit of it Ravenel is a good is a, is a free society and he kind of like smashes his hand on the, uh, the desk loudly and we cannot let it go back to that if you don't see anything on the surface, there might be something hidden in the shadows. Keep in mind, it's the only way that Ravenel found its freedom. We finally got into that temple and saw it for ourselves that all of it was a sham, at least for 
at least for Cantargirl and Ravenel. So if it looks, he's looking for words, like it's not a big deal, that they're practicing within the realm of law, we need you to even look, look even deeper. Because my gut tells me something is wrong. Very well, then. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead, Milo. I was just saying, Milo says, uh, with, with Asmodeus, there, there is no good. They, they, they were the ones who kept us in chains. They were the ones who, who, who kept us in fear for our lives. The reason we're free is that they are no longer in power. The, there is no good in Asmodeus worship. Yeah. Uh, Sedru, like, breathes in deeply and nods as you're kind of saying that. And then he gives one last glance to Madden. Uh, I said we find them and we split their skulls. How much deeper can we get than that? People will start talking when we start to hit the narrate people. Yeah. Sedru nods emphatically. It's it's just how it is when Asmodeus is uh, when he is got his tendrils his fingers in something it might seem legal it might seem lawful on the outside but we know beyond a shadow of a doubt something deeper is going on one last thing that we would like for you to keep an eye on while you are visiting this town while you are ascertaining what is going on the Hell Knights have been, impro uh, have been encroaching into our territory. And unfortunately, Cantargo has made a has had to make some type of agreement with them, at least for them to be in the territory. But the Hell Knights are regularly and routinely rounding up former slaves of Cheliax, those who have escaped those who have fought for their freedom or ran for their freedom and dragging them back to Cheliax, kicking and screaming. We know in that region where you are going that there has been an increased Hell Knight presence with people, unfortunately, being brought back to Cheliax. My gut, my thought, is that the Hell Knights, the Church of Asmodeus, are somehow working together. Well, the Hell Knights are independent of the Church of Ismodius. They're called the Hell Knights for a reason. And it's because they believe in the strict discipline, obedience, and order of Hell. It's what they model everything in their organization after. It's more than just a passing name. I think that there might be something more there. So that might require further investigation when you get to the region. Do you have any other questions? What kind of agreement are there with the Hell Knights? I'm not particularly fond on them coming from the fighting pits. Yeah, he nods and says, Well, unfor the Hell Knights are all about enforcing contracts and laws. Um, and so if there is somebody who would be here that is free, although they are contractually obligated to be a slave. Maybe perhaps they sold their freedom. Perhaps they were born into it as a child from families where they had no chance to say otherwise. They're still indentured servants of those in charge in Cheliax. The rule is right now essentially that Kentargo allows for the Hell Knights to enforce contracts within the boundaries of Ravenel. Now, with that said, Cantago has been pretty emphatic that it will, that they draw the line at slavery and that people who come here are free. But currently, the government doesn't have the means to enforce that stipulation. So the Hell Knights, unfortunately, are running rampant. That's part of the reason why they have asked for the Sylvan Ravens to get involved to help. Uh, while they're still establishing an army, uh, police force, and any other infrastructure that is needed to help enforce the laws. 
So if we come across them, I could kill them. If that you... is all I got from that. He looks at you and just puts his finger on his nose and just nods, but doesn't say a word. Mm. You got know, a smile and small little uh, tusk. You're, you're visible. Good. Right. Are there any other questions? What resources will we have at our disposal? Silver Ravens have the ability to get you travel towards uh, this small town. And actually, he at that note, he pulls out a map and brings it on the table. Chicka pow. Oh, wait, you guys can't see it. Chicka pow. Map. There we go. It's the map. Um, so this is the just the region of um, Ravenel. Um, let me show you a, another one just to kind of give you an idea of the scope of how small Ravenel is in comparison to Cheliax. Different style maps, too. Um, if you go to the north of this map of the old Cheliax region that I just shared with you, you'll see kind of like uh, the city with spires on the, on the northern coast. That is Cantargo. Okay? Um, that river to the east, the mountains to the south, and the coastline to the west are essentially the entire part of Ravenel. Now if you zoom out of that map, the entire mounted area, that chain that runs across from, uh, from west to east, that's all Cheliacs. In fact, it even uh, has uh, more land to the east of that. Um, you guys know more than enough about Cheliacs now. And if you look to so the... We oh, are but a suburb of this evil city. Yes, which is part of the reason why the... Um, it's part of the reason why Contargo is uh, not able to get the resources that they need to get to get uh, up and going again because you're exactly right you are this very small region and while and, and you all would know that while Cheliax essentially is obeying the the letter of the law of this infernal document that essentially freed Ravenel and Cantargo you'd also know that they look for whatever way they can to weasel back in there um, to subvert to oppress whatever now, to the east of Ravenel, that, that um, I'll go ahead and use this, this river right here that runs uh, north to south, that separates as a border. This whole area to the east of that river is just a, it's another nation called Nidal. And the whole nation worships the god of pain and misery. And so you've got devil worshipers to the south, and you've got uh, these crazy pain people to the east, and Ravenel stands as like a small nation in the midst of it all. So, as you're speaking, as you guys are talking, um, go. You can go back to the map of the Ravenel region. I'll go ahead and uh, push that one in front for all of you. Sedru brings out the map and you see a another ocean town called Akasazi to the west of Kintargo. And he says, this is where we need you to go. This is the place that you uh, need to go. Now the Silver Ravens will afford you everything they can in terms of travel expenses and food on the way there as well as food while you're there and uh, modest lodgings. Um, unfortunately, we can't provide much more than that as our resources are stretched to other places as well. While there is this cult of Asmodeus, Asmodeus that's brewing in Akasazi, there are other areas in Ravenel that need our assistance. 
Um, the Bellflower Network is another group that we try to support. And all of you would know that the Bellflower Network, like, their main focus is just, like, freedom for the slaves. They have a, essentially, like, an underground railroad that runs all the way through Cheliax up into, um, up into Ravenel. So a lot of our resources are tied up elsewhere, putting out other fires. Do you have any other questions for us? I believe this explains our task very well, said Drew. We shall do what we can to ascertain the true nature of this cult. Though I would like to voice a word of caution to everyone at this table. Yes, freedom was won at a great cost, and what was before this time of freedom is what we do not want to go back to at any cost. But we have to be careful with the words at any cost. Asmodeus may be a cunning and wily demon, a devil that finds ways through words to enforce his will on these lands. But we must be careful that our actions, our zeal to keep things the way they are, does not make devils of ourselves. It's a slippery slope, my friends. Let us go with an open mind. For it is easy when you have weapons, training, knowledge. And he, as he says that, he looks at each one of you, right? Weapons and training, he looks at Madden. Knowledge, he looks at Milo and Sabriel. To fight back that which tries to oppress you. But when you are a simple farmer, simple blacksmith, carpenter, all you know is simple trades, it is very easy to fall in the trap of words, in the trap of promises, the trap of everlasting joy through everlasting pain. The Hell Knights, I agree with Madden. They will feel the sharpness of our blades and the quickness of our magic. But the cult, be careful, my friends. For it is simple people that are being duped. Be careful when we raise our swords. With that, he kind of sits back again and finishes his ale. And kind of, I mean, it's kind of again lost in thought. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. What, which character did you get? I want to say your name right. Oh, uh, Rigzin. Rigzin. I, 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 I was pretty sure. I just didn't want to say the wrong name as an idiot. Uh, uh, <laughs> Milo will say, "Yes, Rigzin. Um, we, we shall." Uh, no one is is above uh, reproach. Uh, n no one is unredeemable, uh, unless they are a, a a devil themselves. That they are irredeemable. But 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 surely there are people who have been deceived and, and who can be redeemed, and we must work to to save these people. Uh, thank thank you thank you, Riggs. I I I agree one hundred percent. But I will say this. If even one who has fallen to evil through ignorance or weakness threatens the life of an innocent, I will not hesitate to act. We cannot let innocence suffer from those who uh, whose innocence is uh, a matter of debate or a matter of complexity. He uh, kind of tails off at that and looks across at Rigson. 
Riggs and nods at both of your words. He doesn't say anything, but he nods. But you can see on his face that he he now has a very worried look based on the two reactions he's heard. But he nods. Right. When we get there, it's going to be hard. The sun's about to be easier just to cut the light from this earth. But yes, I agree. Even though given the light that the freedom was just won against these devils and people are going to go make packs for them, we're in an easy way. To me, that means they're already gone. But if you want to try to save them, I have no problem with that. We can always try. And if they refuse, we can kill them good. He has a very mischievous smile on his face. I was going to ask, did Milo say that? Because, wow. <laughs> yeah. Milo Milo is, is zealous in his in his desire to kill those who are evil. Gotcha. Um, but a, a, as a, uh, an adherent to Saren Ray, he must offer people a chance to repent and change their ways. But if they don't, they must be brought down, like, without any hesitation. Like, you had your chance. You blew it. You're dead. Hmm. Um, so Milo is is very ready to kill, um, while giving them a chance. Um, he, uh, there are devils and demons that have no chance. They will never change their ways, as far as he can tell. Um, but 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 those who have been deceived, he will. Um, he believes in the in the light, and uh, just show them the light. And if they don't recognize it, then they must be taken out of their misery and slain. Um, Milo is excited to kill, although he does, in, in his uh, indoctrination, believe that anybody can be saved and be redeemed from their evil. He has to give them a chance, or else uh, Sir Ray will be very upset with him if he doesn't give them a chance. Yep, yep. It's it's black and white. It's it's perfect. Well, and I mean, like that's uh, that's part of what uh, your character has been struggling with, right? So, I think that's part of the reason yeah, why I, I balked did... as I was like, "Oh wow, that's such a juxtaposition." <laughs> yeah, yeah, because the thing is, uh, just just out of character, um, and I think I'm just so everybody's aware. This is what's going to be happening. Is that. Uh, Providing people a chance and uh, helping people redeem themselves, uh, it is and it's 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 easy, right, um, to say it, but most often than not, you have to walk the path with them, hold their hand, and therein lies the problem. How much do you help? How much do you hold? And when do you say um, no? For this. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So that's yeah. perfect. This is awesome. 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 Yeah, that's, that's, that's Madden's outlook is, you know, he do not laws are just another form of imprisonment to him. He, he feels that people should be able to govern themselves, but he sees the necessity of it, you know, given the situation and, and coming from the fighting pits. But he has uh, one, one, considering that he spent time in the fighting pits under the rule of rule there, that he's like, no, nah, this is, the blight needs to be removed completely, otherwise it spreads. Hmm, hmm. All right. Perfect. So, awesome. Yeah. So with that said, Sedju kind of like uh, backs away from the table and looks at you and essentially says, all right, you leave it first thing in the morning. Um, Godspeed. And uh, we wish you the, the best in eliminating any vestiges of this cult from uh, these lands. And he looks at each of you in turn and nods. And with that said, um, before he leaves, um, mm -hmm. Sabriel uh, asks, says, actually, I do have one more question. If we need to contact you, how should we do it? So he actually, uh, he's like, oh, he reaches into his satchel and he makes, um, he tells all of you, all right, I need you to meet at, uh, on the outskirts of Kentargo. You'll see your wagon. You'll see uh, the 
everything that you'll need to be able to get to your destination tomorrow. And he gives you like the exact address for it. Uh, and in addition, I am supposed to give you this. And he gives you eat, or no, he gives you four scrolls of uh, sending or, or message. I, I don't remember the exact name of the spell, so please forgive me. I will get that to you um, between now and next week. Uh, but essentially, it's a scroll that lets you send a about a message that's 30 words long, and it can go directly to whomever you want. And Sedru essentially says, I am your contact for this particular assignment. So, when you arrive there, please send us one scroll. When you have ascertained the nature of what is going on, please send us a second scroll. When you have taken care of whatever needs to be taken care of, send us a third. And when you are, are planning on leaving, send us the fourth. Understood. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, great. Excellent. With that said, uh, any other questions? Any other thoughts? Any things you need? All right. And he uh, pushes uh, away from the chair, gets up from the table, nods to each of you in turn, and leaves the cuddle club. At all. Um, so he leaves the cuddle club and you all four are left around the table if there is um, if there's nothing uh, so if you would like to purchase anything in Cantargo while you're here um, what we'll do is we can talk after the session and um, you can say hey I've been looking and before we left I wanted to bring this and we'll just make that retroactive just so that we don't bog time right now make sense Fair yes. enough. That's good. Yeah. And then um, what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll fast forward to the next day, if that's all right with you guys, unless there's anything else you'd like to do. Uh, no. I mean, Rigson would just be sitting at the table, uh, and then eventually, you know, he would, you know, at this cuddle club, if there's some beds, he would find one and just, you know, he doesn't plan to go back home. He's left that behind him. So he's going to, you know, sleep here the night and then make his way with the rest of the group to the meeting point outside uh, Kintargo. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Anybody else? Any last things or just fast forward? Oh, we can fast forward. Uh, but Milo, in, in, during the montage of fast forwarding, uh, Milo will be praying to his god. Um, in, in the morning, there's a whole routine. But, but y'all will see him like swinging incense and, and raising his arms in prayer and being very devout. Um, he's a true believer. So. Yeah, Sabriel stays up far too late trying to study spells he can't cast yet. And he, he, if there were a montage for him, you'd see him way too late scrubbing in his eyes, trying to focus on a page that he's too tired to read and looking very frustrated with himself. Okay. The morning comes after a night spent in rest. You make your way out to the outskirts of the city once again. And let me go ahead and uh, just so, um, just because maps help me, I'm going to bring up the map of the city of Cantargo again. <clears throat> you make your way. Uh, after eating and drinking, make your way, uh, taking this road out towards the Ravenel Road over here, past the gate, the, the group of you, to the address that Sedru told you to go to. And sure enough, there is a uh, wagon is, uh, with uh, supplies that you might need, and you all load up, making your way off towards... Akasazi. <laughs> uh, the travel isn't uh, too terribly long. 
making your way, uh, uh, you eventually come. Uh, you you you're actually going farther south than uh, than just cutting across the river, um, hoping that you might be able to find a kind of a bend in the river or something something where it is a little bit more uh, easy to get across. Uh, it's probably about mid afternoon when you uh, hit a, a pretty decent uh, area where you think, okay, the river is the thinnest here. It's a little bit awkward to traverse, but we think um, this is where we're, uh, this is the best possible spot for us. So uh, all of you should see uh, a map that had just popped up for you. And I'm just going to go I'm ahead. Not, I mean, it, it's not quite loaded on my screen. How are y'all doing? Oh, there it is. Got it. Yeah, it's still, still waiting. But I'll get that. Okay. We'll go ahead and give it a second then to let it load for everybody. Um, when it has loaded for you, go ahead and put an X in the chat, right. just so that way uh, we can proceed when everybody is good to go. Oh no, Zypher disconnected. Mm -hmm. Is he still in Discord? Oh no, I'm in Discord. Yep. I, I don't know. Uh, I was trying to close the old map, and then it, I, I think I actually kicked <laughs> myself out. Oh, X off oh. the program. <laughs> yeah, X off the program. <laughs> Easily done. No worries. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we? Uh, we're we're getting pretty close to done, but while uh, X is getting logged back in, why don't we take a, a, like a, a minute bathroom break? Go run, grab uh, go potty, grab something, and while X logs back on, and gets loaded up. Cool. Fair enough. Sounds good. Yes. Thanks. All right. Awesome. All by myself. Cool. Uh, when you're back, if you just go ahead and write back and chat in Fantasy Grounds, that would be fantastic. <clears throat> okay, this is thing still trying to res trying to resolve connection to the server. Uh... Hey, I see you just connected. Yes, yeah, it's correct. Quite and quite just. <clears throat> uh, uh, Sim said he was back in Orkish. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, that's actually a fun little feature uh, for those of you who don't. Um, uh, yep, I can understand them. Yeah, for the for those of you who don't uh, uh, see it, if you go to the bottom, if you go to the chat box and go to the bottom right corner, right above the words that say chat, see a little word bubble that's blank. It allows you to choose what language you write in, and it will post it in chat accordingly. If your character doesn't understand it, you won't be able to actually read it. <laughs> oh, interesting. I like it. A fun little feature. Um, hmm. Looks like everybody is back at this point. Um, is every and it looks like everybody's got the map pretty much loaded up. Um, X, is the map yes. loaded up for you as well? Yes, I can see the map. Great. All right. So if you guys can't see your people, you're in the bottom right-hand corner of the map, so you can go there. Um, map is uh, pretty easy to navigate, just so you guys are aware. You can press down your middle mouse button, your wheel, to kind of move around the map. Uh, you can zoom in with your wheel, zoom out with your wheel, so on and so forth. A fun little feature that I find helpful is if you hold down Control and left click on the map and drag, you can resize the map to whatever you'd like it to be, or at least the window of the map. So that's kind of helpful as well. Um, that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to the top right corner of the window, you'll see an arrow pointing up and right. If you click that, it will enlarge in the map and essentially take up the entirety of the space that you are in. Um, and then you could place other things on top of the map if that helps you, like your character sheet or what have you, to help you see a little bit more. Um, cool. All right, so your crew... Um, actually, one, one more question. Um, yeah. So I've got a map for food. How do we scroll around the map? How do we pan? Uh, that's a, you should be able to hold down the middle mouse button. Mm -hmm. The mouse wheel is what I use. To, I click on the mouse wheel to click and drag the map around. Mm -hmm. Does that work for you, Wander? Doesn't seem to be working for me. I can zoom in and out with the mouse wheel, but I can't. The alternative is that in the bottom left corner of the uh, map, there's a little tiny uh, compass in the little golden square. If you click on oh, that yeah. and move it, that might move the map around for you. Yeah, use the middle button. I pulled it down to move it around. Oh, nice. Thank you. Yeah, the golden thing looks me. Thanks. Great. Um, cool. Um, just trying to think if there's anything else we need to touch on. Um, great. Okay. So you guys are beginning to make your way across this river, feeling you like you found the uh, thinnest part of the river to cross. Um, you know that uh, it's going to be a bit difficult to do it. Um, just because the river is still a river and you got the wagon, you don't want to go all the way down to the next town because you would lose out on some time. Um, so perhaps you're taking a, perhaps you decide to move on down through the town. Uh, but during lunch, you decide to stop here at this location, uh, at least for a moment to stretch your legs, to get out. If you decide to cross here, that's fine as well. <clears throat> and... Uh, as you guys are kind of like unloading the wagon and uh, getting just for lunch or getting out, um, I need you all to roll me a perception check. Our first roll of the game. So if you go, oh, perfect. Somebody's already on top of things. Got it, Milo. Uh, if you guys go to your character sheets, your perception check will be under your skills. Um, it will also... Uh, and so what you can do is, when you go to that, your skill tab on your character sheet, you can double click on the number, the white box with the die. There you go. Madden got it. Yeah, the okay. one that says total, under the total um, box yes. is what you'll click. Correct. Um, the other option, if you like rolling dice, well, I mean, I guess you roll dice no matter what, bam, you got it is if you left click and drag on that box, it will pick up a die for you. And you can toss it in the chat box, just like I did for Madden. And it will let you actually roll a virtual die, which is kind of fun. 
right. As you are looking about, Milo, you notice some kind of movement on the cliff to the north of your party. Kind of some uh, some movement in the bushes. And as you are uh, kind of like really uh, appearing into it, that same exact moment, uh, Sabriel, um, you notice some movement as well. What do you all do? Milo would have wanted uh, that there's, there's something ahead. I see it too. We should be I was just saying. Out that uh, Riggs, sorry, Riggs made a mistake. I I threw performance instead of perception. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Right. He's performing his perception. You were you were dancing while also being alert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to take off permissions so you guys can move your tokens. Um. So as you as you make out of, uh, to the party, hey, I noticed something out there. Uh, something is heard, and there appear to be some people in the bushes that kind of like uh, pop out, and they essentially yell, "Give us your money! Your money or your life!" Rigzin kind of walks up a little. It is a fine afternoon. Why don't we be about our own business? and not engage in thievery. Right. We'll let you mind your own business if you give us your money. Um, Sabriel is uh, sidestepping towards the bushes. Uh, just, just, just not, just, just surreptitiously. M Madden would chime in. I'd like to give you my life if you'd like to come down here and receive it. <laughs> uh, uh, what if they, 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 they look and they pair at each other. We, we really just want your money, but we will take your life to get your money. Well, then come and receive it. All right. So uh, everybody, let's roll for initiative. Um, Isn't that like it? Where, how does that work? So that? here, yeah. So so in Pathfinder, your percep in Pathfinder two E, I should actually clarify, your perception check is also your initiative. Um, with that said, if you go to the main tab of your, uh, yeah, there we go. If you go to the main tab of your character sheet, you'll see a button there that lets you roll. There you go. We got Milo and we got Sabriel. Okay, while well, you guys are doing that. <laughs> Okay. Oh, I think I skipped one of my guys. There we go. That was a whole of a row reason. Okay, here we go. Madden, it looks like you are first one in the initiative to go. These guys begin essentially unloading slings from their pouches, getting ready to pelt them down uh, onto you on the low ground. So now let's talk some mechanics of Pathfinder 2E because we've created characters, we've done a lot of role play, and that's been awesome. But now we need to get into some mechanics. Every round, you have three actions. Pretty simple. You can do anything you want with those three actions. You can move three times. You can move and attack twice. You can move twice and attack once. Whatever combination of you want it to be. We can reach into your pouch, drink something, and move. I think you get the gist. Um, your speed dictates how fast you can move. If you go to your character sheets and you go to the main tab of your character sheets, it will tell you your speed, which is 25. Each of these squares are five foot squares. So you can effectively move 
um, that many squares per round. So if your speed is 25, you can move five squares. If your speed is 20, you can move four squares. If you decide to move twice and your speed is 25, you can move 25, or you can move uh, 10 squares. You guys get the gist. Now, um, that is the three round mechanic, and that pretty much is through everything. Um, you also have one reaction, which allows you to react to whatever is going on. Um, perhaps you have the attack of opportunity uh, feat, because not everybody can do an attack of opportunity like in other uh, fantasy TTRPGs, including Pathfinder 1E. Um, in Pathfinder 2E, not everybody can do an attack of opportunity. So casters, you don't always have to necessarily worry about uh, casting a spell adjacent to a target. Um, nice. So Madden, let's take it a step at a time. We'll go ahead and get this. You're up. Um, if you would like to try and scale the cliff in front of you, that would be an athletics check to try and get on up there. Or if you just want to try and shoot back, you can do that too. What do you want to do? Yeah, he's going to have to scale. I think I got a feeling him and his jab when it's not going to work out too well. He's not. <laughs> I mean, he throws it, it's gone. Now he's going to have to climb the wall anyways, right? Yeah. <laughs> so he would, he would scale it. Um, All right. 20, would that be two actions? 20, 25? No, because I'd have to move. Well, it depends. Cause that's 25 to get to the square before. Yeah, so it would take at least it would take one action to get to that square, or uh, so to get to that square, and then you would have to roll uh, an athletics check to see if you're able to successfully traverse the cliff, and um, that would essentially be your other two actions because I think uh, you can climb essentially half your. It would take you two move actions essentially to get back to get up that cliff. All right, so that's what he'll do. Okay. And if it helps, each round is about six seconds real time for your character. Okay. So okay, so go ahead and move your character there and roll me an athletics check uh, for your second action, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and set the DC at twelve. Oh. <laughs> okay. It looked like it was about to go to that 10. I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. Another mechanic. So another mechanic that I should also share with you guys uh, while we're playing. Uh, I set the DC for things. If you fail it by uh, 10 or more, that is a critical fail. If you succeed it by 10 or more, that's a critical success. That includes in combat. Um, so for this instance, what I'm going to say is that Madden, um, you just start climbing slow. You essentially are only able to get halfway up the cliff with both of your actions. I'm not going to say you fall or anything, uh, but you're, you're like just slowly making your way up. You're going to have to spend more actions to climb the rest of the way for the next round. Okay, Milo, you are up. Milo will. Um, he will. It, 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 again, super enthusiastic. Um, um, <laughs> he will uh, rush ahead. Oh, I'm moving the arrows instead of myself. Um, he will move ahead. I, I, I believe it was the square. Um, and, and he will. It's within 30 feet. Uh, will this work with Pythagoras? Or is this not within 30 feet? What do you say, GM? <laughs> is, is what in. What are you attempting to do? I don't know what you're uh, trying to do. Uh, uh, I'm trying to target someone with a 30-foot range. Sure. So what I'm going to say is that um, what, what are you trying to attack him with? Oh, I'm just casting a spell that takes two actions. So I, this is as far as I can go. Sure. I would say I that. Think, I, I would think for it. Yeah. Uh, is it. Is it a combat spell or is it a like a effect spell? What do you... Okay, I, I, I'll just tell you. I'm, I'm casting command. And then I, I look at this, this the one that's closest to me, and I tell him, um, um, it's time for you to run away and never return. And I will cast command, and he will need to roll a uh, 
a, a will save. Cool. All right, so here's another fun thing about Fantasy Grounds. Press shift while you have your... Uh, uh, so highlight your token. Press shift mm -hmm. or control. My bad. I think it's control to Is target, control? yeah. Okay, control. And then you'll be able to target a creature. Okay. Um, you guys should yep. see a little ruler pop up. This is a fun part. So now I don't even have to roll the will save. What you're going to do is just roll the die next to command. And it will roll the will save for me and tell me whether or not he succeeds or fails. Okay. So he rolled a natural, uh, he rolled a two for a total of a five. So he looks at uh, Milo and he's just like, oh, oh, guys, I gotta go. It's, it's not right that we're doing this. And he, um, when it's his turn, uh, something will happen. But he does yell that out. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, um, that, that spell took two actions. You moved with one action. Those are your three actions. And that's it. Okay. Uh, uh, just an FYI, um, mm -hmm. I think because X, because I've uh, used just a perception check. His initiative is showing up as blank, whereas it should be an 11. Oh, you said it should be an 11. Thank you for that heads up. Ah. Yeah. I will move him accordingly. I mean, he, could, he could always re-roll it to get up there. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Real higher. Okay. It is number three. I'm going to call them... Um, you guys can know that these are just, these are just bandits. Um, so bandit uh, three is actually uh, gonna take a step over here, 10, 15, 20, 25. I don't know what magic you used on my friend, but I'm gonna make you pay for it. And so he is gonna target Milo with his sling and try and hit his AC. Okay, I rolled a 12, so that is just a miss against Milo. He's like, I'll get you a second time. Loads up another one. Oh, so he has reload one, which means it takes him one action to reload his swing. So that's going to be his turn. It oh. is Bandit 4's turn. Sabriel, you're on deck, so get ready. Uh, Bandit 4, 5, 10, 15, 20, uh, 25. He's going to stand right there. With his club out and ready in action oh. as he looks down. Sabriel, you are up. And Rigzen, you are on deck uh, after Sabriel. Go ahead, Wanderer. I'm going to do one thing. I was thinking I was going to do two, but I'm just going to move across to here okay. next to Rigzen. That's a move um, action. It looked like he was. Looks like he was heading towards the bushes, but he, instead he uh, he does this, and then he makes a gesture and mutters a few arcane words and uh, touches uh, um, Rigson's sword. Is it he has um, mm -hmm. whatever weapon he uses, and it begins to glow, and uh, he nods to Rigson, um, and I think that's it unless I can do more movement. But I guess seeing as I've stopped, does that uh, finish my Correct, yeah. When you stop your movement to, okay. to do the spell, it finished your movement. Cool. Okay, cool. Rigson, you are up. Uh, Rigson is going to shake his head, uh, not understand people's need to hurt themselves. And uh, <laughs> he, he moves up uh, to the cliff wall and attempts to climb. Um, oh. Where is that skill? So uh, DC twelve okay. athletics check. Hold on. Eighteen. Okay, cool. So you spend uh, two rounds uh, to the other two parts of your movement, and you're able to climb. You are at the cusp of this uh, cliff, like getting ready to climb up, which triggers my other bandit's action. As he sees... Uh, before, uh, before I do that, I'll be climbing up, and I'll be seeing Madden struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll say, are you planning to gift your life or just give it to them? What's, what's taking you so long? And he continues to... 
climb up. <laughs> I'd have to give him the opportunity first. <laughs> okay. So uh, this bandit is going to go ahead and target uh, uh, Rigzin. And he mm-hmm. has got his club out, like I said. And he is uh, going to attempt to smack you as you're climbing over. So because you're climbing and you're in a compromised position, this is going to be a minus two to your AC. So what's your current AC? Okay. Uh, hold on. Uh, uh, AC is uh, 60. 16. All right. It's, it's the one on the main sheet, right? But it's in that shield? Yes. Yeah, 16. Okay, cool. Uh, all right. So here we go. He brings down his club. It's going to be a 20 total to hit you. And so that will be a hit. So I'm going to go ahead and give some damage out. Max damage. Seven points of damage, Rigzin, as you're climbing over the cliff. And he just, I'm going to say clubs you like, bam, right in the head. And you, like your, your, your vision starts to swell. Go ahead and make me an athletics check because you're still climbing up. You're not like over the lip, right? So Good. go, and we'll see if you are able to maintain your hold on the, uh, on the rock. Okay, so yeah, you're able to just like barely maintain your hold on the rock uh, even after you're beamed. He's like, oh, so it's not going down easy, easy. And uh, Rigzen, that's your turn. All right, it is. Uh, these guys are all numbered all wonky. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, okay, because it's showing up. Yeah, it's just weird. All right, so uh, this guy is going to go five. Uh, 10, 15, 20. I'm sorry, he should be running away. Oh, you're right. He uh, He's like, oh no, this isn't good, guys. And he just uh, books it. <laughs> um, and he uh, actually gets uh, to the cliff and uh, attempts to climb it. I'm going to roll it uh, while I, Oh, well, that's a natural 12. So he would succeed. So he begins climbing this other cliff to get over, and he'll uh, get up to the top next turn. All right, it is Bandit One's turn. What are you doing running away? Get back here! And he uh, <coughs> kind of comes over here, 5, 10, 15, uh, 20, standing on this rock in kind of a precarious position. Uh, but he sees uh, Milo out there, and um, and actually he sees both these guys climbing. So he's going to take his sling, and he's going to attempt to hit uh, Madden, who's running up the or, or climbing up the rock. So he puts a pellet in it, poof, swings it, and it hits Madden uh, f- uh, with a 23. And oh. that is going to be one point of damage, Madden, as this thing just <laughs> plinks off of you. Uh, but I still need you to make me an athletics check as you get hit. Um, DC is lower because you didn't get too hard, so I'm going to say like DC 8 just to maintain your grapple. Don't roll a 1. There you go. There you, there you go. go. You're all good. Uh, and then he spends his turn reloading. Madden, you are up. All right. Uh, so how, uh, how how far down is this cliff face once I get up there? So this cliff face is probably about 10 feet, and you're, like, maybe about 7 feet. So you're a couple feet from the top. It's going to take at least uh, one more action to climb up there. Yeah, no no problem. I just was wondering if I, like, threw him down or something, if it would do anything. But it's not. I believe about the bruise. So he's going to climb up, so you need an athletic check, right? Yep. Good. All right, so yeah, you're able to get over the threshold, but he's in that same square that essentially you're trying to get into. So one action was to finish your climb. Two action, you're kind of like in this square with him. What do you do? Uh, Well, I, I guess the only reasonable thing to do would be to push him back a square, shove. Cool. All right, so give me an athletics check uh, to just, like, shove him back. Uh, Okay, and so he is going to resist that with his own athletics check, which is... Which he doesn't have athletics, so it's just a straight strength roll for him. Five. All right. So yeah, like you push him back a square. Uh, I didn't like that. 
and uh, you now occupied that space that he was in. So that was action two. You've got one action left. And we'll go ahead and uh, uh, does it take an action to bring out a weapon? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does actually. So he'll pull out his great sword. Okay, cool. Madden pulls out his great sword and gets ready to throw down. Milo, you are up. Uh, Brandon, you are muted. Apologies. Um, can you explain to me if, if I were to roll a cantrip that's normally uh, two actions? Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me just go in. Like, tell you exactly what I want to do. Is I'd like to roll a divine lance. This is a cantrip for damage. Um, uh, using the good um, um, alignment. Um, is it possible to use all three of them for additional damage? Or is that for like... Um, I'm just seeing what it says, which is that if I were to uh, heighten the spell, does that mean like one more spell level, or does that mean one more action? Uh, let me see the context of the spell. Which spell are you trying to cast? Divine Lance. Divine Lance is the spell. Um, I'm trying to make the most of my ah round. okay so heightened means that when your spell moves up a level it will do additional damage like you can cast so it, it as a level like one spell and it will do a higher level two, yeah so it would you can cast divine lance higher. as a level one spell um, but it would yeah. cost one of your sp slots and it would cost yeah no you know, be one d four nah I'm 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 just gonna stick to the cantrip and I'm going to um uh attack this gentleman who's over here next to the rocks um sure that's that young uh, um cantrips always cast at your highest level i was reading that cast at the highest level of spell you can oh cast. so maybe that's what it means by heightened so is that so i think it right? does it, it is it means the same thing yeah but that's yeah for each level, that's, that's what before. you get but uh, you will cast it at level one, I believe. I think. But maybe that's uh, height and beyond first. I don't know. Uh, I tell you what. Why don't you, uh, Brandon, go ahead and yes. make that attack roll, and I'll go ahead and look up heightened in the meantime, just so we're all Here. on the same page. I'm going to go ahead and roll uh, 1d4 plus my modifier. Uh, sorry, let me attack, attack roll first, I suppose. Um, or if you'll do both. Let me see what happens here. Nope, that was a damage roll. Um, let me try an attack roll. Well, you killed him, um, and that wasn't fair. Well, I, got, I haven't attacked it yet. I know, I'm just... I'm just <laughs> okay, now I attacked it, which I imagine 19 will hit it. 19 will hit it, and we'll go ahead and just take that damage. Um, yeah, D4 is... 4 D4 is great. Uh, okay, cool. So, wow, you rolled max damage on that. And that was yeah, like yeah, just yeah. enough to kill him. So, hey, so bad. Uh, so this guy falls into the water with a splash as a spark of divine energy comes out from Milo and kills him. Um, starts his body starts floating down the stream. Okay, it is Bandit. We'll call him Bandit Three. Uh, he had his sling out uh, that he just reloaded. So he is actually going to go ahead with this uh, Madden right in his face. And he's going to take a step back. And he's going to, instead of targeting Milo, target Madden with his sling. So it's going to be a 12. It's going to be a miss. The bullet just goes right over Madden's arm. And he drops his sling on the ground and pulls out his club as his third action. Okay. It is uh, Bandit 4's turn. And he is, uh, he's just going to wail on Madden, who's right there. Um, he's got his club out, so here we go. Time to go to, uh, I have to untarget rigs in now. All right, so here we go. Club attack. Okay, so his first attack is a miss. What is your AC, Madden? 17. Okay, so that's not 10 or lower. Um, so it's not a crit fail. 
Uh, but he is going to try and swing again because... Actually, you know what he's going to do? He is going to attempt to shove you off the cliff with a strength check. Uh, so go ahead and roll me a an athletics check, Manon, against his strength check. <laughs> okay so he rolls a 12 total against your nine um all right so uh he like you're just like maybe you're like getting your weapon out as he's doing it but he pushes you forward uh go ahead and as you're uh, getting ready to fall roll me a reflex save to see if you're able to grab the edge of the cliff in time or if you tumble to the ground below Oh, okay. Oh, jeez. So, Madden, you fall, poof, like, you're just, like, totally caught unaware as this guy, like, pushes you off the cliff, rigs in. You see your buddy just come falling, flies right down in here. So what I'm going to do is uh, I roll a D6 for falling damage for every 10 feet. So that is going to be six points of damage. So, Madden, you land uh, pretty hard. Um flying off the cliff and then rolling into that tree all right that was uh his uh he attacked he shoved and now he's going to uh he's gonna stand right there to hopefully uh get his buddy's help sabriel you are up rigs and you're on deck okay so uh sabriel uh looks at the two bandits facing um Rigs in, and uh, he is uh, um, again. He makes some gestures and uh, mutters something, and three glowing darts appear next to him and uh, uh, speed unerringly to towards them. So the one bandit three gets two of them, and uh, bandit. Right, so bandit four gets one. So oh, uh, cool. let me. So this is bandit one, bandit three. So is this, and this one's bandit four. Right. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So your uh, magic missiles. Two of them go off towards bandit three, and uh, you see him like. <laughs> Uh, just takes this damage and it almost like knocks him back as he see, doesn't see where these things are even coming from but nonetheless they hit him um, he doesn't look like he's in really good shape the uh, final one does max damage against the guy that's left uh, leaving him pretty hurt um, alright thank you Sabriel Rigzin you are up uh, so I would like to finish my climb would that be one move? Uh, 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 yes. Well, actually, no. You you essentially got into the square once it vacated uh, because it took two okay. actions to climb up because you succeeded at that. Okay. So you have your full so do actions. I still have my three actions. Yes. So you I have all three. Three, three actions now? Correct. Cool. Okay. So with one, I pull my sword out. Okay. And then the first action, the second action would be to take out bandit three with an attack. Um, okay. So that I would go to main or to my inventory. So first thing I want you to do is while your target is highlighted, pro oh, you yeah, you got it. Just uh, you accidentally targeted yourself too. So um, oh. <laughs> it's okay, you, you're, you're on the right path. So uh, just press left control and left click on yourself to untarget yourself. Otherwise you'll accidentally hit yourself. Perfect. Wait, now, oh, hold on. Uh, how do I untarget myself? Uh, you just did it. Okay, and now... So, yeah, your long sword okay. attack will be under your actions tab on your character sheet. Action. Mm-hmm. And you should see long sword um, underneath weapons. Action stuff. Where's the action stuff? Oh, all the way at the bottom. There I go. Uh, yes, and... Wait, how do I... 
So, uh, oh yeah, good question. So you, uh, there you go. So what you're gonna do is, you see that, um, you see where it says plus seven, that little yellowish yeah. box that says plus seven? So you have a choice. You can drag and drop that box and it will give you a D20 you can toss in the chat box, or you could just double click on the plus seven. Perfect. Okay, so you uh, strike out at uh, Bandit 3, but it just barely misses him. Um, okay. okay. And my last action would be at Bandit 4. Okay. This is him as well. So, okay, so one thing, just so you're aware, you're, uh, so here's how the yellow boxes work under your actions tab, X. Um, plus seven would be for your first attack. Plus two would be for your second attack. And minus three would be if you decided to use all three actions to attack. Oh, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So your second attack would actually be at a minus five. So that's just a total of a 10, which isn't a crit fail, but it just misses uh, both of those guys. Okay. Okay. That is your turn. Uh, one uh, move, uh, two attacks. Bandit three gets over it, and he's out of there. He just decides to run the F away. All right, Madden, that brings us to the top of round three. You are up. You are currently prone on the ground. All right, well, it's time to stand back up. That's one action, right? Yep. <laughs> and then another two to climb the, the, the cliff face here. Yep, go ahead get and... Get back up. Yeah, go ahead and give me that athletics check. Okay, yeah, you smash it. So uh, you're essentially in this square uh, now uh, Now that there's nobody there. Um, you can act and attack next turn. Or fall down again. Oh! <laughs> okay, so okay, one small thing that we forgot. Um, oh, the magic weapon. Yes, you, got, you, uh, you had magic weapon cast on you. Which gives your attack yes. a plus one. Plus one to hit and plus one damage, yeah. That's a really good reminder because this guy's AC is 16. That hits because of magic weapon. Nice. So, uh, oh, nice. so go ahead and roll me damage for Bandit 3, X. Okay, so yeah, uh, describe your kill. Oof. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as, uh, uh, Rigzin climbs up and pulls his sword out, I gave you a choice to leave here alive. You didn't take it. Hope you meet your God. And with that, uh, Rigzin, you know, brings the sword in an arcing, uh, motion from left to right and basically, um, slashes across this person's torso. Um, in essence, kind of opening him up and, you know, organs spilling out. Okay, and he falls to the ground, limp and dead in front of you. Um, one other thing to consider, too, it's not as big of a factor here, but magic weapon actually uh, doubles your weapon die. So you would get to roll two d8s for damage as oh. long as you have magic weapon on you. Holy shit. Okay. Yeah, so for, keep that in mind for the future. Madden, okay. uh, that was your turn. Milo, you are up. Um, uh, Milo will um, step up. Oh, gosh. What am I going to do? Um, I'm going to go ahead and cast... Uh, forgive me. They can't trip. Uh, I'm just going to give guidance to uh, Rigzen as the next melee person. Uh, so I'll cast the Guidance, which is... We'll give you basically a plus one to whatever you roll um, next. Ooh, nice. Uh, and uh, that's it for me. Okay. It's I'll Bandit. Say, go, go get him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is uh, Bandit Force's turn, and he's like, well, I'll push you off before, and I could do it again. And he, uh, uh, and as he goes to push Madden, it's actually a feint as he goes to actually push Rigzin off the cliff. Oh, so Rigzin, geez. I need you to give me a uh, athletics check against his strength With check. a plus one, if you so decide to use it. Oh, yes, a plus one for sure. <laughs> 
Oh. <laughs> Eleven. Uh, okay. Well, we'll see if we'll see uh, we'll see how that goes because he's rolling his strength check. That's a seven. It is not enough. So he like nice. pushes up against you, and you just kind of like plant your feet into the ground and refuse to be moved. That plus eight was fantastic. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and then he just says, "Roll it." Still kill it you, and he takes his club and tries to uh, hit um, Rigson. So um, let me go ahead and untarget Madden. Um, I'm going to count that first shove as his first attack. So he'll actually have a minus five to this. So that's a that's a total of a five. Um, what's your AC, Rigson? Sixteen. Five. Okay, so that's a crit fail because he was le uh, 10 less than your AC. So he essentially grabs his club, and uh, what I'm going to say is you like bring your shield up just as he's bringing it and down, and you just knock the club out of his hands. And uh, when he sees that he's got no club and there's these two guys with these swords, he's like, ah, roll it, have fun, and he just uh, bolts as fast as he can. Um, and he looks like he's getting to the wall uh Attempt. Uh, he can't climb this turn, but he looks like he's going to as soon as he can. Sabriel, you are up. Okay. Um, Sabriel was. He's going to. Uh, he's going to cast uh, Ray of Frost. Oh no! Hold on. I don't think I can. I, can I see that bandit from here? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. The, I don't think you'd be bushes. able to see him. Yeah, with the bushes oh. and everything. Yeah. Which is in the height. Yeah. Okay. So, Sabriel's just going to move across to the bottom of the cliff for now. Um, and I think he will stay there for the moment. Okay. Um, Rigs actually, in. no, I guess he can, oh. he can climb up. It's not far. All right. You don't mind? Yeah, yeah, go ahead and roll me an athletics check. Yeah, with the actions. DC yeah, 12. Let's just do that. Okay. Athletics. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, you begin to climb that. Was that was like a three for a while. Wizard. <laughs> 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 that's when you yeah. like, that's when by sheer force of will, you're like, oh. <laughs> uh, Rigzen, you are up. Uh, seeing the bandit run away, uh, and seeing that the others have dispersed or have been killed, uh, Rigzin uh, sheaths his sword. That should teach you a lesson. <laughs> do, not, do not attack wanderers. <laughs> okay. I love that. He sheaths his weapon. All right. I'm done. Um, I'm going to assume it's Madden's turn. Madden, this guy is fixing to run away um, unless you do something about it. Sim. Yeah, we're not gonna let him run away. He's gonna. <laughs> <laughs> Might run to his friends or something, and we'll have trouble down the trail later or whatever. He's gonna go ahead and uh... sudden charge. Oh, okay. What's sudden charge? Uh, I could dash up to my full swing. So I got swing strike twice. If I end my turn movement within the melee reach of a at least one enemy you can make a melee strike against that enemy okay awesome all right so you bum rush him as he's uh, up against this wall and that rock um rush his bum. so go ahead and move your token up to where it would be and uh what we're gonna say i'm actually gonna say that between the rock and his back towards you he's at a my his ac is at a minus two So it'd be thirty because if I move diagonally, each round is ten, which is insane. Uh, so it's it's actually every other square, every other diagonal is ten. Uh, at least that's how it was in one e. I might have to adjust that. So your first one would be five, then fifteen, uh, then. I mean, I'd get there within thirty. Regardless, yeah, but yeah, you'd be good. Okay. Okay, so target a, 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 the other token by holding down control and then left clicking. Good, you got it. 
And then go ahead and do your attack. Go ahead and roll that damage. And go ahead and describe your kill. Oh. Yeah, so as the guy is running away, Madden doesn't like being pushed down cliffs and blames everybody for it. So he's going to chase the guy down. <laughs> and as he's running, Madden's just going to catch up to him. And as, as he's running with full speed, he's going to uh, swing his greatsword back and just bring it up to him as he runs through him as well. So he's, he's going to stick him and he's, he's trampling him at the same time. Okay, so yeah, there is a uh, sickening squelch as your great sword uh, pierces him, and he falls down, and then a, uh, a a series of crunching sounds from you just trampling him as he is super dead. All right, y'all, first combat down. Congratulations on your win. Let's see here. Uh, okay, cool. So the uh, battle ends with uh, one of the bandits just clearly running away because of the suggestion that he was given. And the rest of you essentially um, getting ready, uh, um, fighting them and uh, defeating them. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Um, the battle ends and uh, you have a moment... Um, uh, you have a moment of peace to continue your your lunch, and we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and end it here for the night. Uh, what are the last things that we see as we see your party eating before continuing their travel? Uh, Sabriel, Sabriel's, oh, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, Sabriel is very practical, so the first thing he does is takes the uh, uh, goes to the bodies of all the bandits gathers them up and then starts searching them separates any valuables out including equipment and takes them down to the cart um, and then uh, once he's got the and it's just the bodies left he uh, he turns to the others and says I see some loose rocks over there should we just bury them here I don't know if we bury them, other bandits won't know not to do the th same thing. I think we should leave them for display. Um, My Milo actually agrees. Um, uh, in kind of a strangely cold, cold way. Um, it's like they, they made their decision. They are not redeemed. Sabriel shrugs, says, very well. No, uh, no, no. They might not have had a choice. They might not have had a choice but to attack us. I understand that what they did is wrong. But, like I said before, things are tough all around. Mm, poverty can force men to do things they would not do under other circumstances. I would prefer not to leave them to the I will, I will help you bury them, and I will say a short prayer. May their souls find salvation, that which they could not find in this lifetime, in this realm. And so I will share... Good, good. No, you got it. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, with that, um, um, you know, rigs and bends down to pick up uh, the bodies and uh, finds a place uh, over here um, near the water. And uh, in his backpack, I think there is a uh, what am I? What's is there? Um, like a crowbar, and he uses that to start uh, digging a few holes. Don't forget the people drink out of that water. Oh, no, no, I'm not burying yeah. them in the river, but just close by it. Yeah, we could go out there. 
go over by the rock face where there's loose rocks or something and just put a cairn mm -hmm. over them. Milo will grudgingly assist uh, Riggs in, in, in burying the dead and um, and kind of half-heartedly say his prayers for the dead. Um, um, uh, may, the, may the dawn bring new light, he says, as, um, as he secretly or kind of uh, subconsciously, if not like obviously, is very grateful for the chance to punish those who would do evil. You notice that Gabriel's uh, uh, fine with burying them and he, he works hard to bury them. When it comes to the prayers, he kind of, you get the impression he's staying around just to be polite. He doesn't really seem to show much kind of interest in that side of things. Um, He's not rude. He's not disrespectful. But he's mm. yeah. He's not obviously not uh, devout. I think Milo may may have noticed this, but just noted it. Noted it. Kind of put that aside. Took that may, to mind. May I want to help move some rocks over to help cover him, but you kind of not, he's not going to dig the hole for him. <laughs> Fair. It's going to put dirt on top of him. <laughs> yeah. uh, Rigzin would kneel down in front of all the graves. I may not have known you. I did give you an opportunity to live, but you chose death. May you find peace where you're going, for I do not know where we go after this. May in the next realm you make better choices than you have done today. And with that, he kind of sighs and gets up and looks at Milo and says, Do not be hasty in judging others, Milo. We have not walked in their shoes and do not know the sufferings that they have gone through. They might deserve our sword, but they do not deserve our judgment. Milo silently nods to you and takes it to heart. He respects you as an elder. These are not unwise words, but he still feels like we were completely in the right. My theory is you don't bury things that wouldn't bury you. Milo also nods at that, like, you got a bad point. <laughs> <laughs> So you are right, madam. You are right. But then what is the difference between us and them? Mm. We should not we should not let people's evil define our actions. Rather our actions define how people get inspired by it. But I do agree with what you say. Again, I do not judge. With that said, you can see kind of uh, you guys ch -ch -ch, digging the holes in this little area by the river. Um, Riggs and maybe constructing some type of marker for where these bodies are and the mounds. <clears throat> um, the camera kind of like pulls away from all of that as, excuse me, as it ends and kind of shifts on the uh, towards the road ahead towards uh, the town you're going to and the funny thing is as the camera looks at it you can't help but see dark clouds on the horizon with that said we will end our session there for the night woohoo nice thank you guys so much for hey. playing Prankster. Thank you for running. Yeah, thank you for running, dude. This was awesome. Glad. Yeah. Yeah. Re really good. Uh, that was such an epic start as well. The way you, you framed the start of it. Really good. Thanks, man. It was very well done, sir. I respect the crap out of you for that. Appreciate that. Yeah, I really do.